Genesis 11 is the final chapter in the proto-history, leading up to the nation of Israel. Despite being given a second chance after the flood, humanity continues in their sinful ways and tries to claim something they did not earn. In the region of Shinar, a group of humans gather and build some sort of tower in order to try and establish sacred space on their terms, which results in one final decree from God to punish and help the people of Babel before a new plan to redeem humanity is initiated. The text begins by noting the whole earth had one language. Some suggest this literally means everyone on earth had one language, but such an interpretation is unlikely. The Hebrews use this phrase to refer to limited regions elsewhere. Plus, the very next verse notes the passage is referring to a plain in the land of Shinar or Sumer. So it probably means that everyone in that local area had one language, which possibly could have been a precursor of Sumerian or Akkadian. What happens next is the people construct a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens. When many people read this story, they think it is an attempt by the people to literally build a tower that will reach the firmament, from where they can storm the heavens and take over. But this was a later idea that was read into the ancient texts. Robert Alter says, Although there is a long exegetical tradition that imagines the building of the tower as an attempt to scale the heights of heaven, the text does not really suggest that. Its tops in the heavens is a hyperbole found in Mesopotamian inscriptions for celebrating high towers, and to make or leave a name for oneself by erecting a lasting monument is a recurrent notion in ancient Hebrew culture. So basically, the text of Genesis 11 is not speaking of a time when people thought they would reach the firmament and take over heaven. It fits with the way Mesopotamian texts speak of constructing a ziggurat. Ziggurats were large structures in ancient Mesopotamian culture with a raised platform and they were meant to be the highest structure of a city. Scholars believe they were meant to function like a gateway so the gods could come down to the city from the heavens above. They were not about getting man up to the heavens, but getting the gods to come down to the earth. In this sense, they were more about creating sacred space and making a way for the gods to enter into the midst of the city. As Jacobson says, it gave the townsmen visible assurance that the god was present among them. Numerous ancient texts also speak of ziggurats functioning this way, as a gateway or stairway between heaven and earth. So Genesis 11 correlates well with how ancient Sumerians and the Babylonians spoke of ziggurats. And this shows it was not about reaching the heavens, but for the heavens to come down and create sacred space in the city. This is obvious later in the text, as it speaks of God coming down to the people, and it correlates with the overall story of Genesis. In Genesis 3, remember that humans lost access to sacred space and were exiled. Babel is essentially an attempt to regain access to sacred space with God. Now from that alone, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong, as later in the biblical text, God comes down to Mount Sinai and then later he enters the Temple of Solomon to receive worship. However, the difference with Babel is that they are building a ziggurat as a means to an end. Sacred spaces or temples are meant to exalt the name of God. However, here, the workers are building this sacred space to make a name for themselves and to protect themselves from being scattered. The themes of Genesis carry on, especially here with the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve are in sacred space and focus on gaining wisdom for themselves, not trusting God. Kenneth Matthews puts it like this, Genesis 11, 1 to 9, mirrors the attempt of humanity in the garden to achieve power independently of God. The attempt of the Babelites to transgress human limits is reminiscent of Eve's ambition. As in the tower story, the divine plural also appears in the garden account, and both indicate the divine distress 
over the potential havoc that the new knowledge achieved by mankind may bring about. In Genesis 4, Cain goes out and either he or his son build a city to honor the name of the son, which results in humanity moving further away from God, and in turn boasting of their own accomplishments and sin. In Genesis 6, the sons of God produce men of the name, which causes the earth to be filled with pride and violence, which brought about the flood. At Babel, they are also focusing on their own cultural developments, which will make a name for themselves. We can also find a correlation in an ancient Mesopotamian temple text, where the king Warad Sin says, I put there forever my royal name, in order to make praise of me, for the future I deposited a foundation inscription. So it is likely the builders of Babel had a similar idea. They were constructing a temple in Ziggurat to make a name for themselves, not to truly honor God. Now, even after the flood, humanity is still not honoring the name of God, but seeking its own name. The reason why they think they're making a name for themselves and constructing a sacred space for God has to do with how ancient Mesopotamians viewed their gods. In their culture, they anthropomorphized the gods in ways we would consider extreme. The gods needed sleep, food, they had sex, could become intoxicated, and were ignorant of affairs outside of their immediate experience. For the ancient world, the gods had needs, and they created humans to fulfill those needs. John Stevens says, The main purpose of human existence on earth was to please the gods by providing them with food and drink. Humans would provide food and gifts for the gods in sacred rituals, and in turn, the gods would provide order and protection for humans. John Walton refers to this as the great symbiosis. Both sides were codependent on each other. And so, in their ancient mindset, providing a magnificent sacred space for God as well as everything they thought he needed, would result in God praising them and showering them with rewards. Some early texts speak of the gods rejoicing when a ziggurat was constructed. This related to their fear as well, that they would be dispersed all over the face of the earth. Some believe the reason God is angry with the builders of Babel is because they are remaining in one place instead of spreading out and filling the earth that it is an attack on urbanization in favor of a nomadic way of life. But such an interpretation is unlikely. First, God never condemns city living, and in fact, eventually comes to dwell in Jerusalem. Second, being told to fill the earth doesn't seem to be a command, but a blessing. Third, filling the earth seems to refer to multiplying, not directly moving out. Walton says, the means of filling the earth indicated in Genesis 1 and 9 was not by scattering, but by reproducing. Fourth, the text never indicates God is mad at city constructing. It is more to do with how they have come to view themselves and God. The real reason they fear being dispersed probably related to their own survival as a natural consequence of growing in size as a community. When communities grow and stay in the same place, there are two options, urbanize were spread out. In Genesis 13, Lot and Abram opt for the latter and separate. The builders of Babel do not want to scatter and opt to urbanize. Not wanting to disperse is not a sin. God never scatters them just because they are together. However, their solution to a growing population and being worried they will have to separate is to try and appease God by setting up sacred space to meet the needs they think God has and in return, they will be provided with resources and the protection they need to continue to urbanize, and thus, their name will be great, because they earned the favor of God, and He would have allowed them to become a great city. But what they think will happen is not the plan of God. In verse 5, God comes down as the ziggurat intended to happen, and He sees the city and the tower they have constructed. Many think this is a subtle implication that the authors believe, as the Mesopotamians did, that God is not omniscient, as he must come down to see the tower. But what is probably taking place is the authors are using literary devices to insult the Mesopotamians, 
who built massive ziggurats to make a name for themselves. Here is this massive tower, which the builders are so proud of, but the Almighty God just happened to miss it. Gordon Wenham says, With heavy irony, we now see the tower through God's eyes. This tower, which man thought reached to heaven, God can hardly see. From the height of heaven, it seems insignificant, so the Lord must come down to look at it. God's descent to earth to view the tower is no more proof of the author's primitive anthropomorphic view of God than is God's asking Adam and Eve where they were hiding in the garden in indication of his ignorance. It is simply a brilliant and dramatic way of expressing the puniness of man's greatest achievements when set alongside the Creator's omnipotence. Victor Hamilton agrees. It is difficult to miss the irony in this verse. The builder's intention is to erect a tower whose top will be in the heavens, that is, among the gods. But even though they build the tower, it is so far from the heavens that God must come down to see it. Thus the authors are employing literary devices to insult the builders. Even an omniscient god missed their puny ziggurat. However, the ziggurat builders desire to bring God down to their level, not just presently, but also in terms of how they view Him. They seem to have come to envision God in a way that exalts them, by believing He is more like them, with human-like needs, and requires their service. This corresponds to the original monotheism model of Andrew Lang and Wilhelm Schmidt, which we've explained at great length in another video, which is that humans in their most primitive form are monotheistic. But as humans settle down and develop cities, they begin anthropomorphizing God to make him more appealing and chase after lesser divine beings as well. Anthropomorphizing God means he suddenly has needs, and if God has needs, then people could exchange gifts for rewards. Bringing God and other divine beings down to your level is more useful and pragmatic for people who want to use God for selfish gains. So the implication by the authors of Genesis is the Mesopotamians' view of God is a degraded form of religion and view of the Creator, where they thought God had needs, and if they met those needs, God would protect them and give them resources so they would not have to disperse. And they would also be rewarded by having their name made great. As J.J. Finkelstein remarked, the Babylonians, it would seem, fashioned their gods in their own image more faithfully than the Israelites did theirs. However, for the biblical authors, this is not the way God truly is or how he used to be viewed by the ancestors of the people in the region. And they seem to use this degraded Mesopotamian view of God to joke about how ineffective and puny their ziggurat is. God comes down and notes what has happened. This is not a statement that God is worried humans will be able to one day overpower him. Instead, God is simply pointing out that if they can anthropomorphize him as they have now, imagine what other terrible beliefs they will come to accept. As Walton says, Babel went beyond mere idolatry. It degraded the nature of God by portraying him as having needs. The author's own presentation of the material demonstrates his understanding of the symbol. In 11.6, Yahweh says that it is only the beginning of what humans will do. If they've already begun to view God as inferior and with needs, imagine how far it could go. Nothing will be impossible for them. Turning God into a drunk, betraying him as desiring sex, being bothered by noise, etc. In other words, the biblical authors tell us it was not their religion that evolved from the Sumerian religion. The Sumerian religion degraded away from the true depiction of God, which they claim they have retained through the traditions of Genesis. God doesn't ban urbanization, because that was never the problem. His response is a penalty, but also a preventative measure, similar to his response in Genesis 3. Remember back there, God cuts them off from the tree of life, to prevent what sinful man might do with immortality. It was both a penalty and a preventative measure. Likewise, God is concerned about what the builders of Babel will continue to do if they go on unchecked and continue in their current ways. His response in verse 7 
is addressed to his divine counsel, and his decision is to confuse their languages and disperse them. This way, they will no longer be able to continue in their ways within the city, and as a result, their fears have become their reality. In trying to use God, they lose the very thing they were trying to protect. The biblical authors then conclude this section with yet another attack on Babylon. The name Babylon comes from the Akkadian phrase, meaning gate of the gods. But the biblical authors insult this name by tying it to a similar sounding Hebrew word, which means to confuse. In other words, they thought they were building the gate of God, but what they are really doing is just babbling nonsense. Kenneth Matthew says, Though they sought a name, they received the humiliating name Babel. God has once again exiled his people away from sacred space because they sought to abuse and degrade his name. The later implication in scripture is God has given them over to worship false gods, which given how the degradation at Babel progressed, it is what the people wanted anyway, and they refused to seek the true God and know him by his true nature. So God disperses them and they chase after other gods. In a sense, he has divorced them and sent them away, giving them over to the desires of their hearts. But that is not the end of the story. Now that humanity has abandoned God and become the seed of the serpent, God will now begin the plan to crush the serpent's head by starting a new family through a new man he has elected. Instead of this man trying to make a name for himself, like all the sinful predecessors, God will make his name great, and through the work of God, all the nations will be called back. Similar to God dispersing the people away from Babel for their own good, God calls Abram out of the region for the good of the people he dispersed. At this point in the story, the serpent had all but one. Even the man God appointed could not produce a son. But through him, God would make a new family. Israel considered their origin divinely planted because Isaac was born miraculously and not only through natural processes. He essentially wasn't the seed of the serpent, but a seed of God that would grow to be a light to the nations. The war was not over, but a new chapter was about to begin, one in which God would create a new nation to call back all the other nations that abandoned him. The restoration plan begins in Genesis 12.